<laughs> you can sing a song, perhaps. <laughs> Just, like, slide the window and be like... <laughs> Okay, you're ready. Okay, so uh, I hope there's people watching online. Um, my name is Rico Leva, um, and um, Giancarlo is Sernagiotto. Sernagiotto, yeah, yeah, that's okay, right. I said Very it. Italian. Is, I said it right. We're from Kanjan Music, China. Um, China is a very uh, unique, um, different, and uh, hard to penetrate market in the music industry, but it is the largest micro market in the world. Uh, so you, hi. <laughs> so as uh, some of you may know, um, China does not have access to much of the global um, social media and uh, internet uh, websites. So anything from Google, Facebook, Instagram, uh, even TikTok in China is branded differently. Uh, so they cannot really find new art is the way that the Western world does. Uh, but on the other end, China is very much technologically advanced uh, and there's plenty, a lot of interesting opportunities and developments there. So our job uh, and our goal here is to tell you a little bit more and I guess also give you an overview and tools which you can use for yourself, for your artist, for your label, for your publishing company, or for your technological company, it doesn't matter, in which you can benefit from this um, and also find ways to collaborate. Um, the other thing it's, th that's also, I guess, a, a difficult task is the language barrier. Um, but thankfully, we speak English. We speak English, and yeah, a little bit, We do not speak Chinese. And a little bit Macedonian myself. So. Italian, we have a spectrum of languages. Uh, so John Carl is going to start. I'm going to punch in at some point. Uh, and uh, where does this lead? Does this lead to where it's we're our website, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. it's, you can try if, yeah, if you want to scan um, it. No, thank you for the introduction, Ruth, and thank you for being here. My name is Giancarlo, and the commercial manager at Kanji Music. And my role basically is to oversee all the licensing operation of Kanjan, uh, so digital distribution, publishing administration, sync and general licensing services. And recently, I've always uh, I've also been in charge of the whole neighboring rights division, which I've implemented myself. And just to um, see the points we're going to be talking about, a general introduction as Ruth did, we're going to be looking at some numbers, which are, I know might be a little bit boring, but in, in, in the case of China, they're really interesting. And we're going to discuss streaming platforms and in general some DSPs present in the territory. And then I think we'll, we'll be talking about the social media part of the promotion or like growing the artist brand in China. So um, as Ruth was saying, uh, like the digital landscape in China is very different. Uh, you know, there's this thing called uh, the Great Firewall of China, which has been implemented by the government and basically uh, blocks people in China to access any kind of platforms in the Western world. So they do not have access to Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, but also Amazon, uh, eBay, you name it. Pretty much all the platforms that we use are not present in China and they have the Chinese version of pretty much everything. And this is interesting because like the fact that uh, these platforms are not present basically allowed tech companies in China to grow in a very fast way. And it's also thanks to um, the competition that arises between these companies that China can develop as a market, as a country in a really um, fast way. Uh, another interesting premise about China is the tier system, which is something uh, not officially recognized by the government, but still is the reality of things in China, specifically within the music industry. So for example, you can see uh, there are different cities. Uh, usually there are four tiers, um, tier one, two, three, four. And for example, Shanghai or Beijing would be in tier one, uh, which are the cities where you have the most part of international expats living. And this is really interesting from the music perspective because if you're targeting, like if you want to enter China and you want to target some niches or um, subcultures, you really have to take into consideration what's happening in the city. So even in terms of the SPs, for example, uh, you see, now you probably don't know all of them, but we have QQ music or Natty's music, which are present in uh, the main cities. And as you go into different, different tiers, you see different platforms coming up. So, uh, for example, Kugo or Kuo, which are the two Ks, or uh, Xiaomi, Huawei, 
So I think it's really important to understand how these platforms work and how the mentality of these people in different cities in China, um, how these people behave. It's also, I just wanted to oh, punch yeah, in here something interesting. It's genre specific. So for example, um, let's, take, let's take punk music, all right? Punk music um, is the most popular or one of the most popular genres in Wuhan for all, from all places, which yeah. is famous for <laughs> another thing, as we all know. Days. Yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> but um, do you understand? Like, some places thrive culturally in a different way. That's what the tier system is. And it's, for us, it's very difficult to comprehend because we don't have that many people. We don't have that large population, that volume of, 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 of humans concentrated in, in certain cities. So, um, it's very important to address this in the beginning because it makes easier uh, connection of, to any sort of like genres that you might work or you might be interested in uh, to know how they are positioned in China. Yeah. Indeed, absolutely. And again, specifically also hip hop, which is, we've seen rising uh, in the Western music industry. You know, it's not something that you would usually find on tier one, DS tier one cities, DSP. So you really have to be aware of all the dynamics which uh, un are underlying in, uh, in the Chinese territory. And speaking of DSPs and platforms, we see that the majority of companies operating in China are tech giants, pretty much. We have some examples here, Tencent, Alibaba, NetEase. Uh, these guys make up for pretty much hold the market. Uh, just, I think Tencent alone makes up for almost 60% of the market. And they do operate in pretty much any sector. It can be like the entertainment sector, it can be the fitness sector, sports, leisure, pretty much anything. And what also is really interesting about these companies is that, for example, Alibaba and Netis, they were China. And in less than 25 years, they managed to, first of all, get a hold of uh, the whole market, but at the same time, you know, have millions, well, billions in revenue and they completely dominate China for any kind of usage. And as, for example, we can see here, there are some examples of companies developed by these three giants. We have WeChat that you probably know, is like the go-to app for pretty much anything in China. Uh, they have Tencent Music Entertainment, uh, which also has under its umbrella Tencent Pictures, Tencent Gaming. You can see, for example, uh, League of Legends. I think it's a pretty known game. And for example, Alibaba has Halipay, the equivalent of PayPal. Actually, they took over PayPal as the biggest uh, e-commerce and online payment company. There's Taobao, uh, which is probably the equivalent of our eBay. So everything in terms of online sales happens through Taobao. And NetEase as well, uh, which is also one of the biggest DSPs in China. They have NetEase Games, NetEase Pictures. So you see, they, they tapped into pretty much all the areas of um, the Chinese um, real living in terms of application and more. No, it's, it's loading. Yeah, I know Ooh, this, is, this, is like, this is a very tricky slide, let's say. Uh, we're just going to stick to the music industry for the purpose of this panel. But really, anything and everything happening in China is directly related to the government. Everything, there's, um, the government has been promoting, especially in recent years, a great censorship. And if you want to do business in China, you really have to take into account how the government behaves, what are the rules and regulations, because you know, it's, it really can be a matter of seconds before you're completely erased uh, in China. Your brand can be completely erased. And oh, yeah, I just want to say that also this changes very, it changes very dynamically. Yeah, so indeed. like topics that weren't like sensitive last year can suddenly be sensitive this week. And you know, artists or brands that have tapped into certain fields uh, can, can get really massive damage. And there's a lot of examples I think we also have in the presentation. Yeah, we do. Even like, um, even just on our line of work, for example, when we deliver music to the stores, you know, all the music has been reviewed um, by one of our teams because we have to comply with the re uh, regulations and we have to make sure we're not releasing music that with, you know, with uh, contents or lyrics that are against the government. There's a bunch of uh, themes that cannot be really discussed. Uh, for example, so there's like the rule of the three T's, which are three topics that can never be mentioned in China, which is, uh, well, Taiwan's independence, 
which is also a very recent hot topic. Uh, there's the events of Tiananmen Square in 1989, and there's also the Tibet independence, which, you know, if you say something about this in China, either publicly or even, you know, privately, because what happens, for example, with WeChat is, uh, let's say you're chatting with a friend, you send a message which says something um, kind of against the government, your friend is never going to receive the message on the other end of the phone, and you have someone come knocking at your door asking for, um, you know, explanations about what you said. That's really the, the level of control they have over Chinese people. And... One positive thing I'd say from the government perhaps and specifically specifically relating to the music industry is what they've been doing in terms of advancements and developments. Um, since 2015 roughly they started really paying attention to copyrights and making sure everything to their best extent I would say uh, make sure everything falls within um, the rights of the correct rights holder. There was a case um, I think was some time ago, but uh, a guy basically uploaded a track from Beyonce independently on one of the main DSPs and it was collecting all the revenues because no one actually checked who hold the copyright at the time. Now this is not possible anymore, luckily. But also uh, another standard practice in China was to for DSPs to buy catalogs and they were buying these catalogs exclusively. And imagine, like, uh, from the perspective of an, inter of an international company, uh, having access to a myriad of platforms in China. <coughs> Sorry, uh, being um, <coughs> being uh, you know mm, stuck with just a single DSP or just a single platform in China actually hinders greatly your chances of success. Uh, now this is not happening anymore. It's actually illegal. And also in recent years, I think uh, it was as of June 2021, uh, there has been a legislation on neighboring rights, which I think is really positive because neighboring rights are not even recognized in all the Western countries uh, today. So I think they're trying to, specifically with the music industry, to to create a more fair uh, industry and with even because more people more and more people are looking at China as a focus market these days. So, you know, it wouldn't it wouldn't be uh, fair for them to be left out of the music industry or like the, the creative industries in general because this, uh, I mean, we're talking about music today, but I think this applies to pretty much any industry in China. And that goes like the power of the internet. Again, it's similar to what we were saying. Uh, basically, it's a great tool. Everything happens digitally in China, especially with mobile phones. But on the downside of it, it can also um, basically ruin your career in a matter of seconds. For example, this guy that you see here, uh, he's Chris Hu, a very famous Chinese idol and singer. And there were some rape allegations against him in 2021. And basically, his career was done in a matter of like probably a couple of hours. Yeah, there's cancel culture in China as well. Yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. the point. There was a panel the other day, and I think uh, Russia was being mentioned, but I think China is another great example of how these things are still really present um, in many other countries, unfortunately, again. And this connects again with the government, for example. And there's another case, hopefully the video will work, I'll show you in a second. Uh, you probably know the Italian fashion brand Dolce & Gabbana. Uh, let's see if it works. Uh, well, basically, uh, they were to have a um, fashion show in Shanghai, and so they did this like three episode, uh, episodes kind of campaign. And, you know, for them it was just a, a way to present the brand, uh, like um, enrich the brand's uh, image in China. So they did this, oh, probably it's not working. Uh, it's floating. Let's floating. see. Um, in, within these three episodes, they were showing how to eat Italian food with um, chopsticks. Oh, well, let's see.
you get the point. Yeah. And so basically, it was done in a way, in like a funny way, but it resulted as a mocking of the Chinese culture and the way Chinese people eat their food. And the show never happened, the fashion show never happened in the end. And also the brand lost millions, I think, loads yeah, of millions. And the hun yeah, it, they, they lost a tremendous amount of money. And uh, two points I want to make here really quickly is that China does not really have very sarcastic or ironic sense of humor. They, they really don't get our, I'd say, Western ways of fun. Uh, and they're very serious about their culture. So any sort of mocking of Chinese culture results in, in tremendous damages to brands. And that's not the first case. There are many cases like that. And um, a couple of years ago, there was a scandal with the NBA. Uh, and there was supposed to be a tour in China on NBA uh, of the NBA All-Star Game. I don't know what happened. They lost billions. And it was so, to me, a little bit funny because uh, U.S. brands like uh, Tiffany and uh, uh, other luxury brands, Gucci, Louis Vuitton, they started issuing apologies on behalf of something that the, they weren't even involved. That's how they, you know, that's how scared they were because Chinese market is humongous and especially higher um, position brand, luxury brand, they make a lot of money. Um, one thing to me, going to China a couple of times, I've been there maybe 10 times until this point, um, people think that it's a you know, land full of like fake, cheap, fake bags and all that. That's not true at all. Like you walk the cities of Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, I've never seen so many luxury brands in one place, originals. So um, it's, it's, a very, it's a very serious thing. When you know working in China, if you're making money there, you have to be extremely cautious and careful in the way you market, present yourself, and, and topics you touch. That's, uh, that's yeah, quite important. Indeed, and goes for literally anything. Again, we're talking about the music industry today, or like we mentioned fashion, but any kind of brand have, has to be really considerate of all the dynamics. And that's also why you, know, you can't really access China without a partner present in the territory. Uh, first of all because it's really far away in terms of distance but because being like for us kanji music um, we've been around for almost well 10 years this year um, you know we have a relationship with the government with all the players and we know not just on a business level but also on a consulting level in terms of legal and social political aspects how to direct our partners and our clients because again it, it really can all come down falling in a matter of seconds Okay, some numbers now, <laughs> unfortunately for you, but it's actually really interesting. Uh, we, well, first of all, mm, the population number, uh, that was 2021, now it has grown, I think it's probably around something a little bit higher than 1.5 billion, which is huge indeed. And I think what's really interesting about the number, like in comparison with the population, is the number of internet users, which is almost 1 billion. and. Also, um, internet users, like this internet usage is really done on mobile phones. So computers are not really being used in China. Uh, they are used to the extent of uh, working or studying purposes, but everything else is happening on mobile phones and then goes for like literally anything, everything. And you have pretty much an app for everything. We were mentioning in WeChat before where you can have uh, payments, um, messaging, like uh, PR articles, news outlets, everything is done on a handful of apps. And scanned, like you, you scan, you, you walk the metro, you scan, like it's just one stop digitalized in, it is. in one also, app, not even in your phone, because you have, you know, we have Apple Wallet, or you have different apps that you use for different purposes. Everything is actually in just one platform in China. And it also with COVID, for example, I think they were the first, like the first country to implement the, the QR code as a scanning method for, you know, um, checking for uh, positive people. So uh, then we kind of adopted it in the Western parts of the world later, but in a matter of like a couple of weeks, probably they set up the system and, you know, you, you had to scan everywhere, like, and check you had like a code which was red if you were positive or it was green um, in case of negative tests but and these were being checked like on a daily basis like you had to t take a test pretty much every day and people like um, medical staff would go into the buildings and compartments in China everybody was rounded up um, 
outside they had to take a test and and it was like something out of 1984 probably by our will I'd say that's the kind of dystopian world they kind of living in and both in terms of music industry they're really growing in a very fast way uh, we can see like for example 4.8 billion is the expected revenue for 2023 and I think, yeah, they probably, uh, they were like the seventh uh, market in terms of music industry. I think perhaps they gained some positions now because they're growing really fast. And, you know, I think opportunities again are there, but also it's really hard to penetrate China. You know, they're growing yeah. fast, but I would say probably uh, always more on a domestic scale. But because they're like almost 1.5 billion people, you know, compared to other countries, it's really easier for them to, uh, to grow in that sense as well. That number is probably going to grow tremendously once touring is back as well. So this is only like we're talking, you know, purely domestic market or digital and, you know, that kind of revenue. But touring in China is also a big, a big market, which right now is not working. You know, it's not happening. And the China is still close. I mean, they were among the first ones to recover back in the days, but then uh, because of the zero uh, cases policy, as soon as there's even one case, all compartments and buildings are being locked down and you know, people cannot move, they cannot do pretty much anything. And so I think they're now at the third or fourth wave probably. And whereas we in Europe, after like two years of suffering in a way, we can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. And um, oh, this is really interesting, uh, going also back to the kind of um, digital world they live in and the internet usage. So um, I read once an article from a um, um, PR company here in Europe that says by 2025, almost 90% of all contents being consumed will be video content. And that's something that's already happening in China. Uh, we have around 927 million people using video, watching videos and video contents on a daily basis. And what is really interesting is the usage of short videos, which makes up for 94.2%. And by short videos, I mean, we think about TikTok these days, like uh, that's the perfect example, but in reality, uh, they have short videos in pretty much any kind of app. So even like food deliveries app have short videos, uh, weather forecast apps, they use short videos to entertain their customer. So, and that goes also, um, that reminds of the concept of uh, music is like kind of ancillary uh, to the rest of their lives. So in, we do have the streaming DSPs, of course, people do consume music, but the way uh, in which people really find out, um, discover music or consume music is via other platforms. And then they're like, um, from the third party app, they are moved onto the streaming platforms, but really is not uh, streaming or like music consumption in general is not, um, in, it's not being uh, consumed in the same way as we do in the West. Uh, it's interesting like 20.5% uh, is live stream concerts. I think live streams in general are huge in China. It's uh, also in terms of revenue. Um, you know, if you want to, um, if you're an artist and you want to grow your brand in China, really live stream is the way to go even because in terms of tipping, you know, you can make really loads of money. There was, uh, especially during the pandemic when they had to switch from like kind of the offline method to the online world, basically uh, live stream were happening on a daily basis and there were people making, uh, I'd say kind of famous Chinese artists. They were making up to 30K USD per live stream only with tips. So anyway, it's definitely something that needs to be looked at. I don't think the same goes for international artists though. You know, it's still, uh, it's still um, more uh, about Chinese known, artists. Yeah. Let's say if they're known. Um, ooh, this one as well, uh, more within the, the music industry sphere. Uh, like this is actually interesting if we compare it to Spotify, for example, because if we look at the numbers, uh, there's almost uh, 700 million users, uh, music listeners, whereas I think Spotify perhaps has half the number. I think nowadays is probably around 300 million. But in comparison, they have double the paying sub subscribers. So here uh, is about 70 million in China. I think with Spotify, there are around 150 million paying subscribers, for example. So what happens uh, really is that, mm, you know, also streaming is not really, you know, the revenue coming from streaming is not much as we can see. Um, Spotify again is probably around 0 0.003 cents uh, per stream, which equals to roughly say 1 million streams, probably 3000 euro, uh, let's say. 
here in China, you can see the number is way lower, and if you make a million streams on a, any given DSPs in China, then it probably equals to 100 euros, which is really nothing. And that's the reason why digital album sales are really big in China. It's uh, one of um, the best way people take advantage of. Uh, it's in a similar way to what was happening with iTunes, even in the Western world some time ago. Um, you know, they have like singles are being sold for probably 40 euro cents, and uh, the whole album is probably like around three euros, I'd say. But it's still a great way of making money in China because, again, the paying subscribers on the streaming platforms in addition to the very low rate of the streams doesn't make enough money for people streaming in China. And it's also interesting to see that uh, the digital album sales market is not equally for sure, but you know, so there's like a fifth uh, of international artists present in China. So when we think about uh, Chinese music being consumed for the most part, it's also nice to see that there's still an international side to it. And of course, it's just the A-plus artists that make it to that kind of uh, top of the list, but still, I think it's interesting and it gives hope for kind of everyone, who, well, probably not everyone, but for still for people, international acts in China. So here you can see, um, this is another fascinating point about China. We have on the left side the proper streaming DSPs, streaming platforms, whereas on the right side there are all the non-classical streaming platforms. And it's interesting because the biggest part of the revenue you can make in China is actually from non-streaming platforms. Again, uh, platforms that use short videos or music implemented within their services and they're paying for it. And in terms of revenue, uh, it's where the biggest part of the revenue is pretty much. And for example, we have within mainland China only, we deliver to more than 60 DSPs and just a handful is streaming DSPs. Like out of this, let's say 70, more than 50 are non-streaming DSPs. And what do you see uh, with the colored segments, it, it's put in a very simplistic way, but I think it really gives the idea. Uh, we, according to our data, we basically created created this showing, uh, giving the portion of catalog that is delivered to the DSPs of different types of DSPs, uh, how much revenue is being made. So we have, for example, TME, uh, which is Tencent, is a proper music streaming platform. Uh, we have Red, which is a social app, and we have Keep, which is a fitness app in China. And you can see that uh, delivering the same amount of catalog to these three different three types of platforms, you know, you have way more revenue on Red or Keep compared to the classical streaming platform, which is Tencent. Now, I think um, going uh, more into depth about the streaming and platforms, and please be interrupted anytime if you want to jump in, but uh, streaming and platforms, again, it's interesting because when we think about streaming, uh, it's usually Spotify, Apple Music, or classic streaming platforms, whereas in China, you know, pretty much any kind of tech company has jumped into the streaming market. And so we would still have uh, QQ Music or NetEast Music uh, streaming DSPs. They can be um, compared to our Spotify and Apple Music, I'd say. Uh, they're very famous, they're probably the biggest ones because they apply to tier one cities. And also because they're, those platforms are the ones in which you can find the great majority of international catalogs. So international music can be found pretty much on I would say for the 90% on both QQ Music and NetEase Music. It's interesting also to see a NetEase because it's not just a streaming platform, it's also a social platform. So people can comment directly and interact directly with um, within like fans, also fans with the artists. So, you know, there's always um, this concept that keeps coming back that nothing in China, especially within the apps uh, sphere, uh, you don't have an app for just one single usage. Everything kind of blends in for all the usages that they may need. And now going also back to the tier um, topic, uh, Kugo and Kugo, they're still both the Tencent umbrella. They were developed a little bit later. I think Kugo was around 2004 and one year later it was Kugo. And these are important because, again, depending on where you're based in China, you would use a different platforms to consume your music. And also in terms of catalogs, they do have access mainly, if not entirely, to Chinese types of content. So usually it would be Chinese people using Kubo and Kugo. And it's really interesting because, again, they have the live stream option, which we're, we were discussing before 
which is something that you don't see on Spotify or Deezer or Apple Music. And again, it's a way for them to increase their revenue because you have uh, the opportunity to stream music, but at the same time, you know, you can just go on a live stream and buy tips and other um, monetization options. You know, you can kind of grow that 0 0.0008 yuan that we were seeing before. Xiaomi in Shenzhen, hope I pronounced that correctly, should be Shenzhen. Um, it's interesting because those are mobile uh, phones manufacturers. So um, I think Xiaomi probably some of you also have, might have a phone from them. And it's interesting, uh, to the, in the race uh, to the streaming market, they jump in straight away, developing these platforms are built in in their phone directly. So as soon as you buy the phone, you have access to, um, to the streaming platform. And you know, again, it's, and as we will see also uh, within the next slide with Huawei or Vivo, which are still uh, phone manufacturers, uh, shows how much technology drives the whole industry. Again, in this case, it's the music industry, but these companies operate in pretty much any sector in China. And for example, we're talking about streaming platforms, but they do develop, for example, also apps within their phones that can give you access to pretty much any, any usage you may uh, think of in China. And also, alongside mobile, um, <coughs> sorry, mobile uh, um, manufacturers, we have mobile operators, which is something I don't think we have uh, in the Western music industry at all, I don't think, or at least uh, not as known as it is in China. For example, there's Migu Music and Hu Music. One is China Telecom, the other uh, is China Unicom. And you see like, again, I know this sounds um, it's still the same concept being repeated, but it's just to show how much these companies are invested in the music sector and in all aspects of the Chinese people way of li living. And there's also, for example, with Wu Music, you don't incur in any kind of data cost, which is something that now some companies do still uh, also in Europe, for example, but this has been done in China for a very long time, way before we implemented that kind of system in the Western music industry. We were talking, like all the platforms I've been talking about were specifically for the mainland. And um, just, you know, to make a distinction, uh, we refer to mainland and greater China. Greater China would be mainland plus Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau. And um, where you also act, for example, in Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, you also have access to Spotify in that sense. And what we've seen specifically as a company is that when we deliver to DSPs in greater China, uh, we can actually double the revenue of our clients because, again, they, uh, they make room for uh, international catalogs or different types of contents that are not really being consumed in China, but if you move in, ma in the mainland specifically, but if you move outside the mainland, then you have access to a uh, completely um, different pool of users. And again, if you combine also the numbers of people in the mainland plus the people in the greater China, you know, you have access to I know it goes probably to more than 2 billion users and internet users in general. So we think as a strategy in terms of platform specifically is to be as present as possible, even because again, there's no more any kind of exclusivities that apply to single platforms. The platforms are there, companies like us, um, a little bit of self-promotion. But yeah, we can help you you know, reach out to all these platforms. And I think these days also, uh, for example, most Western distributors do at the same time they've penetrated China, especially with greater China. I think mainland China, it's uh, still a little bit more intricate to, to reach, but uh, you know, it's really important to be present in all these platforms if you wanna actually make some real money out of China. Same goes with karaoke, which is huge. We were actually discussing that last night. And karaoke, which has been imported from Japan, it's probably the biggest leisure activity, I think. But it's, it's even more than that. I think you were telling me when you were in China that Chinese people are really, uh, it, they take it very seriously. Like for them, it's not uh, as we go out one night and end up in some karaoke bar. It's not a drunk bar. party experience, yeah. for sure. Indeed. 
And uh, you see, for example, those are karaoke booths. You can have venues with more than 50 of those, but you also like on the street, in the malls, they're pretty much anywhere. And so for example, if your contents are more, um, they have like loads of lyrics or like vocals and they can be sung, then definitely karaoke is the option for you because again, it's, uh, it's really massive in China and it's a great way of making revenue. Also, I would say in a pretty quick way because you know, it's being used like on a daily basis, like people go to karaoke on a ba daily basis, even um, business trips, uh, business meetings, they always uh, end up at a karaoke bar at some point, which yeah, It's culturally, really culturally specific ex experience. It can be anything like a workout for them to, you know, like a dessert after a business meeting. So it's, it's hard for us to maybe comprehend the, you know, the, the, as I, I'm going to use again the, the word seriousness of karaoke, because uh, it's just uh, it's just part of the culture uh, that needs to be, I think, experienced to be fully understood. Yeah, I agree, completely agree. Even because again, it's it's just a different way of approaching karaoke, and also that's the reason why they have developed like karaoke apps, which I don't think are really uh, famous or used here in the uh, within the Western part of the world. Maybe now they are, but again, China has been doing this for. Um, for quite some time now and for example we have we sing or changba and it's not only about again just the karaoke itself but it's also the social function of karaoke you can upload uh yourself singing you can share uh you, the kind of virtual karaoke rooms with your friends on the apps and so again we can also for example deliver like companies can deliver to these apps and you know it's a way uh, it's a great way to enhance your revenue in the territory because you know, streaming alone again unfortunately is not consistent for anyone's strategy in china these are two apps that i mentioned before and again it goes to show the different, like all the different players that come into play when we're thinking about China. I mentioned Keep, which is a fitness apps, a fitness app, and Red, which is probably the answer to Instagram, probably the Chinese answer to Instagram, in a way. And you know, like this is like all these platforms and DSPs is to prove again the point that you have to be considerate of all the different players in the market. Again, we think about streaming, like music streaming, and we think Spotify, Apple Music, just a handful of players. But really in China, there's much more to that than in the Western music industry. And we do have several as well uh, in the US or in Europe, but you know, they stick to just like classical streaming platforms. You can consume music, perhaps they have some kind of social um, function, but still, as you can see in China, it's, it, there's way much more to that. And it's the way people consume music, but also um, are being entertained and also I'd say, um, they engage and share, it's something they can share. I think the, the main point of all of this is that they can share whatever is happening, like the music they're listening to or like the karaoke sessions or whatever, like their uh, fitness session, they can be shared with other people. And it's a way for them, I think it's also from, from a certain perspective, probably in a govern, governmental way, you know, to, they don't have access to many things outside of China and still also within China. So this is the way, this is a way for them you know, to just kind of go on with their lives, just focus on the entertaining part and not have to think about all the other things that are happening in the rest of the world and also within the mainland, because again, like the governments and the, you know, all the political integration that are present in China is something that the average Chinese person there doesn't really notice. I'd say they're, they're not really uh, self-aware in that sense. Okay, I'm gonna leave Ruth speak for a bit. <laughs> Cool. So um, I want to I want to make an overview about um, social media because we we did say that there's no traditional you know there's no traditional social media that we use in China, and um, th these numbers I'm I'm guessing that you know they make sense. What what are the monthly listeners, the NetEase, and the QQ Music? You can see you know a bit, some big difference. Uh, between the numbers and the followers um, of these artists. But um, what is unique about China is that the lack of access to 
social media, which is, you know, our social media and also the um, major platforms, Spotify, iTunes, they're a monopoly. And if you're not, I'd say, like an A-list, super successful, major um, signed artist, it's very, very hard to be competing with these artists because they're on top of all the playlists, they're on top of the algorithm, and each day, as you know, there's like up to 90,000 new songs released on Spotify. So what's, you know, kind of unique in China is that an artist, smaller artist, medium-sized artist, can actually penetrate the system and really have, I wouldn't say a totally equal shot, but quite the chance to reach a much lar larger audience without really like being massive in the Western culture. And these are some, I'd say, you know, some examples um, which have, you know, proven like um, Gallon Crew who has uh, 5,500 uh, Spotify monthly listeners. And then, you know, you can see that it's like, I wouldn't say breeding in the back, but like a lot, com you know, compared to Dua Lipa, which is, you know, I open the fridge and she's in my fridge, I'd say. So this is, this is something to be, you know, very much thought of and considered, um, just based on the lack of having, you know, access to Facebook, Instagram, and all the traditional social media outlets. I think one of the most valuable assets about China is that you really do have a shot. And I think some artists, some international artists, they don't even know they're that famous in China. You were mentioning the case of yeah. a Bulgarian artist. And it, it's really weird if you think about that. Yeah, by the way, there's another one, Kristian Kostov. He is also half Bulgarian. He represented us in Eurovision. We're proud. But yeah, a uh, quick example. There's a major Bulgarian artist, I think he's the most successful Bulgarian artist. The Bulgarians here in the room know him. His name is Aziz. Um, he, you know, he's big quite big. It's a pop folk singer or turbo folk as some, some of the region recognize the genre. We found out he has a song which is called Opa. It was never a hit, neither, you know, in our country or the region here in the Balkans. But in China, it had streams in the billions. Like, it was insane. He had his own hashtag. And Having your own hashtag on social media in China means like you're a massive, tr like you're a trend, but you're a trend amongst massive audience. So um, he was blowing up and he didn't even know. He had no clue. Even the, because um, it was from his old catalog, even the owners of the catalog didn't know. Like no one knew that this was happening. And he was in the trending top 10 of karaoke, um, karaoke stats. So people were going in karaoke bars and, and singing, singing that. Yeah, <laughs> Imagine. yeah I, and I, I didn't even know, like, at all. And I think that happens, I wouldn't say quite often, but it's something that happened. And for example, I see in my line of work when we're talking distribution or, or general licensing sync, for example, we have clients who send over their, um, their roster, the artists they're working with, and we usually you know, do a quick um, research on them just to see it also in terms of potential what can happen in China. And as Ruth was saying, you know, sometimes we find some very interesting numbers. And especially if compared with the numbers of, let's say, Dua Lipa or Taylor Swift, which in comparison from Spotify and the Chinese DSPs, they don't, I mean, they do make They're still money. They're also big in China. Like, don't, don't think that these artists are not big. Like, Taylor Swift and Dua they are famous in China. It's just that there are people around them that we've never heard of. You know, they're in the same pool, let's say. So I, that's something that's super unique. And that is worth doing a research and tapping into that market because, okay, yeah, we talked about that the streaming uh, revenue is not big, but there's so much other opportunities for growth and for, you know, making money in China, really. And uh, more and more and more artists are discovering that. And that's for, you know, we see it on a daily basis for a fact. Okay. So this is <laughs> um, Chinese, Chinese social media platforms. Uh, Weibo is is like, I'd say it reminds me of a MySpace. Yeah, probably, yeah. They, they usually say like Twitter, but again, it's really hard to, you know, pin down a specific definition of these platforms because they operate in pretty much any sector. 
Yeah, the problem with getting an account on any sort of uh, uh, Chinese social media, it's, it's just very difficult. Like, in some of these platforms, you need to have like a Chinese phone number. Uh, the language barrier is also, you know, it's hard to, to go through. There's, even on WeChat, there's like multiple verification processes. You know, take a picture of yourself, you, you know, yeah, all these also things. Also, I think sometimes you have to, when you get logged out after some time, you have, there's a code showing up on like three or four of your colleagues' phones, and they all have to send the same code at the same time, kind of, for you to be able to yeah. log in back to the platforms that we use for working purposes, which, you know, yeah. it's insane to think to some extent. I bought a new phone a couple of weeks ago and I, ha I went through that like three times in a week, having to ask my colleagues to text me a code just in order for me to enter in the platform. And that's like not even, it's not something special. Like they have very high ver verification processes, which, you know, talking about security and social media is something that is not very well addressed, especially now when we're, getting into the conversation of the metaverse, one of the big, biggest questions to me has always been data protection and security, which no one really talks about. Because if you're creating a virtual identity with, where you're buying clothes and like you're having your thing there, we don't know how this is gonna be protected. And China, I think in a way, because everything we've seen so far and everything we're talking about is sort of how all the other platforms internationally in the Western world are going to like they're walking a little bit in the steps of the Chinese digital market like and that's not like my invention that's like the numbers and the in the stats and the trends really show it so um, all these um, ways of just having a little bit higher protection security and uh, authentication is just probably gonna implement in our world as well um, we I think still in a different way though. Yeah. I don't think we'll ever get to the same point as China is because luckily enough, even mm, on a political scale, like we, we're kind of different. I mean, not all the world, but still I think it's gonna be really hard to mm, come to the same level China is, but still it's something that needs to be taken into consideration, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So NetEase, um, this is the, yeah, it's the la largest uh, streaming platform. We already talked about it. Um, it's, again, verifying your artist account to gain access to social media and engage directly. It's not, it's not a super easy process as well. Like, it's not, Indeed. it's not like Spotify, find the name, claim it, and, you know, you, you're now, it's yours. Um, WeChat, that's like the app that we already discussed, is the all-in where everything is in WeChat. I don't even know all the functions, to be honest. Oh, like, same, I'm like, same. oh. I don't think I've ever used it fully, to be honest. Something and new every day. Um, so this is a bit um, how I'd say fans communicate on WeChat. There's like groups, like, fan, like, have you ever been in a fan club? Anyone? No? Okay. I'm old. Uh, That's the same. <laughs> Literally the same, and I think especially in terms of promotion, promoting an artist, you would use WeChat on a regular basis. Even because like to sell merchandise, you can use WeChat. Anything like uh, media outlets are on WeChat, uh, PR articles about your artists are on WeChat, everything. Everything is in there. Yeah, groups are very big there. So, um, for example, Facebook groups, which I, by the way I use for promotion as well, they're just not as... Uh, they don't show in the news feed as much, you're probably aware. But in WeChat, it's just like, you know, like a Viber group or something like that. It's like it shows and it, it, it's quite effective. Um, this is the, the Chinese TikTok, but it's not called TikTok. <laughs> I found this very funny. Do you, I, do you know the reason behind that? Because I always, I try to research why is uh, Douyin called Douyin mm -hmm. and not TikTok. I have no idea, too. <laughs> if you ask right? me. Right? No one knows. Know. But it's still, um, you know, I think probably because of the, they have access to way more use. Well, maybe not anymore because now TikTok is huge, even like in the Western music industry, like in the, the Western way of consuming music and short videos. But I think especially at first, you know, having access to those many people, like more than six, 600 million daily users, you know, it's a lot and you can, monetize we had a case with an artist it was some time ago and one of his tracks were featured was featured on i don't even remember how many videos on tiktok and basically oh, sorry doing in this case yeah. and 
basically all his revenue was coming all from to in like even then of course people jumped onto the streaming platforms to listen to the music and uh, through other media but at first it was just like doing uh, alone and i think it's happening the same also within the western music industry to some extent but still uh, you know it's not the same like still streaming platforms have uh, the great uh, majority of users or it's where people tend to find new music and listen to new music whereas in china it's kind of the complete opposite i'd say yeah yeah and again it's a different way how i'd say marketing and tiktok uh is pretty much the same tailor made campaigns a uh, stream live session but it's just um being on it it's not something that the majority of artists do and it's still you know, if you go big on a platform uh, like Douyin, you can practically go big in China. And that's like, you know, 1.5 billion people. So we, I always tend to come back to the numbers. Uh, Billy Billy. I don't know if there's an example of Billy Billy. Uh, Billy Billy is, pro they intend, people tend to say it's like the equivalent of YouTube, but really imagine it would be a uh, YouTube YouTube, Twitch, uh, Discord, um, Netflix, also Steam. It's like a combination of pretty much all the video platforms that we have. And it's huge. It's, it really is huge. Uh, here it says only email is required for registration, but I was reading a, an article the other day and there was a user from China reporting the, the whole uh, re um, registration process. And there's actually a 60 question quiz that you have to take if you want to register on Billy Billy, uh, basically asking about um, the legislation around videos and video content, um, way like some kind of um, online behavior, some questions about that. So you see, it's really, when we think about this, comparing everything to the information we have in the Western music industry, like just in the Western way of living, it's, it's incredible. And not in a good sense, <laughs> I may add. Yeah, sorry, I decided to, oh, to, please, to, please. to see how many uh, more slides we have because we're um, a little bit running out of time. Uh, but this is, a, I guess, like a, a online music uh, industry chart uh, overview of the, the apps. I, I'm pretty sure you cannot understand all of them because they're in Chinese. But you can just see how the structure is, the content providers, the service providers, the uh, payment system, systems, the cloud computing. Um, so, you know, it's, it's again, um, it's massive, but I wanted to address something um, about the monopoly. So there's a, there was a very interesting um, TV feature by uh, John Oliver a couple of, maybe a month or so ago about the monopoly of the digital payment systems and also the digital stores in the Western world. And as you can see, in China, they're more apps, like they have kind of made it more, and this is uh, a, a little bit of a paradox, they've made it more open in order to actually have competition and challenge between the big companies. And they create, <laughs> that creates better products. That's like the synthesis. You should watch it. John Oliver is great on many topics, but he gave a very good example why many of the Western uh, platforms, companies, streaming, whatever, games, are a little limited in the way they, they create innovation because of the limitation of the payment system and the you know, app store, basically. Yeah, as we were saying before, it's like this is the main reason why China is growing so fast. Uh, it's like it all comes down to the competition between these companies and they want to, you know, be on the, always um, ahead of the market. And it, because this is happening really fast, they have, you know, to always think about new ways of implementing their services and creating new opportunities, new services, uh, new infrastructures, um, which is, again, as Ruth was saying, something that we don't really use. Uh, I think in Europe, like the, in the Western world is way more stagnant probably in that sense. Okay, so I think this is a very important one. So we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna run through it a, a little bit um, faster. Uh, and these are, I'd say, the ways to get to, make to the it China. Into China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a, that's an important one. Okay, um, collaborations. Um, so Chinese artists are quite open. You know, as any artist from you know around the world, you want to 
you want to tap into a new market. Chinese artists do want to tap into new markets. I guess it's a little more difficult because of the, the language barrier and the cultural differences. But collaborating with Chinese artists is, the, I guess, the first way if you want to start you know, want to start something in China. And since talking about the tier system and the genre specifics, there's so many artists that create, you know, different genres of music. We're not talking only about, you know, Chinese traditional, Chinese folklore, Chinese hip hop. There's jazz, there's punk, there's rock, there's indie, there's synth pop, you know. Um, it's about finding ways to connect with them. That's it. Yeah, and one note on this is, Chinese artists, are re they do pay attention to statistics. So if you want to collaborate with them, the first thing they're going to look at is how big are your numbers in Europe, for example. So if you don't have um, a very high number of followers, let's say your monthly listeners on Spotify, you know you can really collaborate with certain artists in China which, have, which may have like greater numbers. So like the strategy would always be to check beforehand how your artists are comparing are in comparison to the Chinese artists you want to collaborate with because they're going to make you save a lot of time and efforts of you know just trying to contact people that probably won't work with you at all. Yeah, uh, remix competition it goes like it's similar to collaboration in a sense. So it's something that we've been <coughs> implementing and seeing work at Kanjian. And for example, uh, Yellow Claw is mentioned, we did a remix song with Vava, a Chinese artist. I think remixes in general are a great way to enter the market because you're taking something that works in other parts of the world and then you're putting like the Chinese kind of input into it and this allows you, but first of all, you can use something that has already been released. You don't have to come up with new contents. You know, it's uh, also a great way, a uh, great way to revamp your um, back catalog, in a sense. And and also, like if it's something that has been successful in Europe, the U.S. or other countries, you know, even the Chinese artists are more interested in working with you. And the the thing again is like the number of people you can access via Chinese artists collaborating with them or having them do a remix of uh, of your track. It's you know it's incomparable to pretty much anything else. And we're gonna talk a little bit uh, about it later when we are talking about our projects. But for example, the Arc North meant to be that was a specific remix competition that we did at Kanjian. And basically, Arc North is a producer from I think he's a Dutch producer. Um, well. We uh, licensed one of his track. We got a competition. I think there were probably 200 artists, Chinese artists, applying to do the remix, and then it, it kind of exploded both in China, of course, where all the remixers were from, but also uh, back in Europe when we sent back, like we released also the track on the on the Western DSPs. Yeah, remix competitions were quite bad in Europe a couple of years ago. It's it's, it's toned down because of different reasons, but it's still going strong in, in China. It's not to be underestimated. Uh, pitching and playlisting, uh, pretty much That similar. speaks for itself, I'd say. Yeah. Uh, the only difference I'd like to highlight in this case is, you know, like um, paying for um, being present on a playlist is actually illegal in, uh, in the Western music industry. Like if you pay to be present on Spotify, probably uh, the contents will be removed at some point. Uh, whereas in China, it's something that you know, everybody does. Uh, it's actually the standard practice to uh, to pay for being included in a playlist. And you know, I'd say also the difference probably is they're more mood oriented. I'd say rather than genre, perhaps as it happens on Spotify. And you have these uh, KULs, key opinion leaders, which are basically just influencers. They run these playlists, and you know, these playlists have. Uh, millions and millions of followers. So if you end up, or like if you pay uh, to end up in one of these playlists. You know, y your music is being listened by, um, I don't know how many people. There is, there is, a, you know, of course, there is a s selection process. Like, it cannot happen to it, to everyone. Of course, if your music is good, if, you're, if the artist is good, yes, it's possible. I think this is nice if you want to perhaps take a picture. Uh, we put together some um, insights on our hand as well, some, some tips that might result helpful when approaching China. Uh, we mentioned, for example, activating an account on the social media platforms, which unfortunately, unfortunately still it, it might be hard to some extent. Uh, playlist problem, we just discussed this one. And as well as editorial, well, we have an editorial team in-house at Kanjan, but I know there are also 
some companies that do the same, you know, PR articles uh, via WeChat mainly because that's where uh, all the contents are being ultimately displayed on. It's really helpful and, you know, there's, I think, many things that can be mentioned, but just as a general rule when approaching um, promotion in China, I think these could be the key points one should think about. Yeah, timing in China is not, you know, um, you got to be mindful always when you talk, when, when you consider st strategy and timeline. And if, you know, the usual is like two, three weeks in the normal world, I, I would even go a little, a little longer than that. We we're even seeing this quite often, even within our own like structure in the companies, just how things are in China in general. Okay. Yeah, the self-promotion part. Um, well, what we did just we explain now we we talked about China and we really want to explain what we do in China. Uh, we provide services that are like 360 degrees to anyone. Meaning again, I was saying before. Um, we work in like digital distribution, public administration, uh, sync, general licensing, artists and promotion services. Here's a timeline of how this has been built up over years. And uh, um, in general, what we do, I mean, we are kind of the gateway to China for most companies and artists in the West. We can see some artists we have had the pleasure to work with. Um, some are Chinese, top Chinese names, but there are also uh, some very good international artists. I'm gonna wait a second before I go to the next slide. I'm taking pictures. And um, some companies as well. Um, there's also Lyric Fine, Robert. And I mean, uh, what we do with these artists and companies, it, it's really, it really depends on each company and artist because some of them might be working with us for distribution, some others for promotion. Uh, there was, uh, Carl Cox was mentioned, we did the uh, defected virtual uh, festival. Uh, it was a series of live streams. We did the same with AJR. They had like a, um, we did a partnership for them with Netis specifically. And I think that went pretty well when we sold lots of tickets. So yeah, it really depends. We provide like the tools and the services as well as I was saying before, like the knowledge, uh, which sometimes I think it's even more important than the actual tools because, you know, uh, we can distribute your music, but then if you don't know how to target the music to the right people or to the right DSPs, then, you know, we can help just so little i'd say so it's it's not about selling a service it's more about guiding you through china and in china because it's really intricate and complicated i'd say yeah. um, so these are some specific projects that we do other than our let's say regular services um Sintali is the remix competition that we do the one i mentioned before when we were talking about arc north uh we do work with traditional music like yedian is a traditional chinese music project we have bao uh, which is specifically for jazz music um jane uh, is a hip-hop compilation that we've been releasing for two years now uh, the aim is to bring together chinese rappers and international rappers and this is just us to show that um, you know, we're directly um, operating in the music industry, not just in terms of services, but, you know, I think most of us are also musicians and have different, do different things in the music industry. So for us, it's also a way to go beyond just the classic, uh, let's provide the service to some people, some companies, you know, it's a, it's a way for being integrated and creative yeah. at 360 degrees. Oh, this, do you want to go with the trade association? No, but, uh, no I was going to yeah, kill me. Oh. I just wanted to jump a little bit faster to uh, IMX, IMX yeah. because this is our this is our uh, important event. This is our uh, music conference and expo. It's uh, the biggest music event in China. Uh, we skipped it this year because of the COVID restrictions. Uh, it was you know it was it was a very difficult year in China in general, but it's going to happen. Uh, in next April, we've uh, we've already started working on it. Um, it's a virtual event, and there's a big, big, massive opportunity to learn and to tap into China. So, if um, if anyone who's here watching this, uh, just make sure to register up front. Uh, be aware of uh, of the specifics and the, and the the way this is structured. Uh, we have showcases on it as well. Um, in the previous years, uh, uh, while I'm, IMAX was happening, numbers were extremely, extremely yeah. 
huge. Yeah, huge. So even through IMX, you can get recognized and noticed and, uh, and create a fan base just by, just by being at a showcase, on, which is incomparable to other showcase festivals, really. Yeah, and I think it's probably one of the best first steps that you can make to make your brand known in China because it's really, again, uh, the conference and the showcases are being watched by millions of people. So, you know, and if you have like a short spot, like an introductory video about your company, your artist, what you do, uh, it's a great way if you're thinking about moving into China um, for your strategy it can be then about distribution or anything else but you know just being present I think it would be really helpful Okay, we made well, that it. That was it. That was okay, it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for staying. By the way, uh, especially <laughs> because I know it's lunchtime. I think lunch was being served, and you were here, so the, appreciate it. Yeah. And this was this was the short version. Just around. oh yeah, indeed. <laughs> this is half of what we do usually. But. There was a question. You want? You had a question, or you wanted? To? Yeah. Let's start with the first one and then. Uh, I don't have the specific statistics, to be honest, about the VPN usage. I don't think you're ever gonna get these. Yeah. Probably, I think in general, they don't want China. you. They don't want you to know. You can get probably statistics from specific VPNs, but that's also confidential information. So neither Nord or Express they're gonna reveal how many people in China are using it. I think it's it's a breach of, I guess their you know their business. I think also in terms of B VPNs, like the government kind of allows certain VPNs to operate, for example, even on a company level, uh, we do use um, Google Drive, for example, even with our Chinese colleagues, so there's a way uh, for them to access certain platforms, but it's very limited to the work environment, I'd say, let's say, if you want to try and access BBC or CNN or any kind of media outlet in Europe or the US or like in the Western world in general, it's almost impossible. And also what you can get um, just to for having a VPN, like if they find out you're using VPNs, what you get in return from the government, uh, it's like, is it really not worth it? Yeah, as a tourist or just as a short visitor, yeah, you can use it and have used it. Oops. But um, yeah, I think it's it also generally, it generally it's not like for the Chinese people in China, it's quite not as common, to be honest, from my personal perspectives. Yeah, I agree. What's the next one? Yeah. I'd say, well, for very big artists, that's quite never the case because there's like a bunch of themes that ensure that that's not going to ha happen because like, the, um, you know, uh, what would happen in that case is like just way too much trouble for anyone to deal with. I think we had some cases, especially with international clients when we're delivering international content. And first of all, I'd say you really depend on the content. And from an international perspective, it's really hard for, let's say, somebody uh, seeing against the Chinese government specifically. So there might be some, some topics that shouldn't be touched, but at the same time, I wouldn't say easygoing, but still we get a notification and the content is being removed from the platforms. I think the major setback is probably that it causes delay. So, for example, if you're planning on releasing an album or a single, um, you, you have really also with IMAX, it happened like when we do the online panels, uh, which are recorded video in some cases, we have to submit everything uh, to the government beforehand. And, yeah. you know, uh, and you don't have any assurance in terms of the timing, uh, how when much they're gonna time they're going to say yes take. or no. It's the so. same with the visa process, by the way. If you're going to perform in China, you want, and you're going, as, you know, as a working professional, you need to submit all the lyrics to your songs, to your live set, uh, whatever, all the process information on the band members. But the lyrics of your live set, they need to be reviewed back in China, and then again back at the embassy where you're going to get your visa. So it's a, 
It's a tricky so one. In terms of television, for example, I know like um, if you have tattoos, you cannot appear on television in China at all. So we wouldn't be able uh, to Oops, be on Chinese again. television. But yeah, it's really, um, and uh, you know, for us, it's really uh, different um, from our standard of living. But it's something that you just have to deal with when it comes to China. I would say only digital, like um, in general physical, because you mentioned vinyls, but I think that applies also to any other kind of physical sales. It's, it's different. No, I'm going to argue with you here because it's different. The physical sales for vinyl are on the rise because of the, I'd say, culture. Like it's a, it's a hip thing now. It's a collectible. So yes, uh, there is a very small market for vinyls, but it's incomparable. You know, based on the the scale of the market. Like the vinyl sales are just peanuts. It would like, no, uh, no, that's it's like really archaic. It's like good, good old thing that it can be found in someone's house. Yeah, I think <laughs> I have CDs. I do. Um, I'm not an example. I'm talking. We're talking about China, so CDs are practically non-existent. But vinyls are on a, on the rise, but not as uh, as interesting as in the in Europe or the US the sales are just you know that would be like Japan in Japan is huge in terms of vinyls for example they will yeah. you know also most companies even from Europe the US used to produce vinyls in Japan so that's probably why also but in China no that doesn't happen no no <coughs> oh. <laughs> That's that's the short answer. I'm very, uh, I, I, I'm trying to elaborate more on the vinyls because um, I I'm excited about vinyl sales. I I like physical um, uh, materials. I'm also as a as an artist myself. So um, I've been trying to get a hold of actual numbers of sales in China. It's still hard to say because of the restrictions. So physical shops. You know, they're not selling, and then the online stats are getting very late. So I don't really know an actual number. I know it's very small from all the data that I've been able to access. I think in general, numbers about China are always hidden. Like, there's no sure way to, like, there's no way to know for sure the really exact know. number about anything in China, really, because they try to keep everything from themselves as it goes with, like, information, news, and everything else. Yeah, we else. still don't know how many were the first infected people in COVID, so you can start with that. Anyway, what was the, uh, you have another question? You want to stack them together, or... We, I don't think we can answer that, to be honest. And we're yeah. also not in China, and we don't want to get political. Mm. So I, I cannot really answer that. It's an interesting that. question, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think we have the... I don't think it's becoming closed. No. Yeah, no, exactly. Even because they're expanding so. more and more uh, in all um, areas of business, so I don't think it would definitely hinder their opportunities and chances as a country to close in that sense. But on a cultural level, um, definitely they are. I mean... Again, talking about censorship, uh, you know, mm, they've been implementing like restricting uh, restricting everything in that sense. But as a business, I think they understand how important uh, it is having businesses with other countries, and in, that goes again for pretty much anything. So I don't think that will happen.
Yeah, indeed, that's also, and thanks Robert, it's also the reason why, uh, for example, we do see certain genres which are, you know, not l really the most listened to in Europe or in the US uh, being huge in China because they, at the same time, they didn't, at first they didn't have access to any kind of international music and then it, all the music kind of got dropped onto Chinese people at some point, so they, like, they discovered Led Zeppelin and NWA at the same time. Their musical taste is very different uh, from ours in Europe or the US, like Western countries in general. There were some stats about the most famous um, international songs in China, and it's, you gotta Google that. It's Oh yeah, it's, it's interesting. interesting. <laughs> it is. Uh, Robert, did you, did you have a question as well? No? Okay. You? Yeah? Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. No, actually they don't. That's what we, I was trying to point out, that it doesn't apply to just major names. Because some of the stats that we saw is artists that have 5,000 monthly listeners on Spotify, which is not at all, like it's not much at all. And they had like hundreds of thousands in China, like almost close to Dua Lipa. So it is quite realistic. And also the tier system that we discussed and the fact that China is very rooted in culture and traditions and they're very serious about music. There is space, there is space, there is uh, a field for world music, for sure, in China. And we see it as a company as well. And we're doing like one of the projects that we, uh, that we showed is for world music. So this is a priority also for us. Um, and that's, I think, one of the good things about China is that there's, you know, there is space for, for many different genres. And they, they might be thriving in a smaller city, but a small city in China is the size of the Balkans, you know? So, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, why, like, one I of the reasons I left this slide on purpose so you have all the information. No. Well, it depends. Like, if you were an A-list hip-hop artist in China, you would be looking maybe for an A-list hip-hop artist in, let's say, Romania, right? I'm just picking a random country. But if you're not, like, if you're doing something in world music, like, it's, it's specific. It's, it's, not, it's not the same recipe every time, but world music is more about, I'd say, like, creating beautiful music also. So if you want to tap into that and you have something that you want to offer and create something unique, that's a great way. It's not only about the stats. Yeah, stats do matter. That but happens not in the genres. same, like also in the Western music industry. Like if you imagine about Dua Lipa, she's never going to do a collaboration with some unknown artist. It's pretty much the same concept, I'd say. Well, hope this answers the question. We can also have a chat later. Sorry, Robert. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Now it's two. Now it's two, now yeah. Now it's two. It used to be one it for a It used to be one, time. but now it's two, but it's not bringing more children from what mm. I'm understanding. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting one, yeah. The age group is something that's quite a problematic, I, I'd say, right now in China because it's an older generation is kind of prevailing. But we have that in Bulgaria as well, so for different reasons. <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, they're encouraging, uh, they're encouraging, and that, you know, the, one of the strongest assets in, in, in China is the workforce. So yeah, they are encouraging having more children. Um, that's not really connected to the way things work in the music industry, of course, but we see, like, there's a big portion of, of younger generation people, um, but as well, having the older generation does resonate with the genre, uh, let's say, taste, yeah. the music taste. 
and it, I, I couldn't answer in a better way. <laughs> Probably, <laughs> no, it's it's a little bit outside the music industry, but no, it's really interesting, especially what Ruth was saying. That you have like old people, like the older generation, prevailing, and now. Um, they're trying, but they're actually pushing for people to have kids, kind of, uh, which is, you know, incomplete. Um, it's like the opposite of what they were saying and doing up until some years ago. So I think. Uh, but in that depends. sense, in that sense, they're similar to, the, to many of the Western countries where people just don't want to have kids that much anymore, or I don't know, they don't have that many kids. So. It's, uh, I guess, similar, for, and maybe for similar reasons, like dynamic and, and workload and stress. Because, str you know, also China's not stress-free for sure. In terms of money, I'd say, because, like, if we think about Shanghai or Beijing, you know, you have loads of opportunities, but there's also, like, a great part of the population which lives in um, utmost poverty, like all the... Um, and the farming villages and cities, you know, we, we see like the great development and tech development in the bigger cities, but then you have to take into account that there are so many more cities and areas in China which are really poor. So I think that's also probably why. Anyone else? We're good? Yeah, because we're gonna get kicked out, I think, at some point. So <laughs> let's go. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.